Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. about Soul of the Fire by Terry Goodkind, a book that definitely had a plot surrounded by a lot of sexism and other things. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And today we're discussing Soul of the Fire by Terry Goodkind. Okay, so I'm going to be very um, blunt. Um, I read the entire thing and hated it. Nicole, how did you feel about this? Uh... If I had discovered this book in middle or high school instead of reading it for the podcast, I would have thrown it in a well in frustration at chapter two. So, uh, we're going to be very- However, I made it to chapter 15, and then I said, (laughs) nope, done. I got to the part Robin said I had to get to. I'm through with this. Yeah, I Did not finish. Do not want to finish. (laughs) Absolutely not. And I don't care about reading the rest of the series either- Um, I read this nine months before recording this, um, because I kept, we needed to record it at a time when Nicole had two weeks to read it, and, like, we didn't have to worry about anything else, and we were about to record it, and then the author died, and doing it right after he died seemed in poor taste. Um, although, in hindsight, now that I've read part of it, that would have been fine. <laughs> uh, I'm okay. So <laughs> that was a joke uh, for legal purposes. <laughs> yes, no, that was absolutely a joke. Um, so we read it. We didn't like it. I read the entire thing, and I understand that this is part way through a series, and that there's backstory I missed from earlier books. I was talking to someone who had read those earlier books while I was reading this. So at the time, I was caught up on relevant backstory things. The very tiny bit of context that I was missing tended to make things worse, not better. So um, all of our uh, dislike for this book has nothing to do with having started partway through the series and has everything to do with the plot that it went with in this actual book yeah also and we'll our first topic is gaslighting so we will get to this Mm -hmm. but having not read the first few did not make this hard to follow oh no at all Mm -mm. so oh it was understandable yeah it was very clear in exactly what it was doing unfortunately yep so with that uh disclaimer out of the way on to our factions. We have Richard, Kalan, Zed, Kara, Fitch, Morley, Beta, Dalton, Teresa, and Claudine. Our first topic is gaslighting. Uh there there's so much. Okay. There's 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 so much. There's gaslighting of us as readers, there's gaslighting the characters. Um, you had a couple specific things you wanted to mention. Yeah. So, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. So there are two 
magical elder teachers that are ostensibly guiding our main character on his magical journey to learn anything, I guess, despite the fact that canonically he has been trained in half of his magic and the other half was ignored because the one elder just didn't get to it for a while and uh uh-oh, it's relevant to the plot, so now they have to talk about it. Um, And these two elders spend, like, an an inordinate amount of time telling our main character something, then a chapter later saying, oh, just kidding, no, 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 that's not what's happening, and then another chapter later having a private conversation between themselves, basically going, okay, I know we lied, but this is fine, but they lot but it was weird because the way it is done as a reader i have no idea and i cannot tell if the thing that they said first and then said in private to themselves is supposed to be the lie or if they lied and they're gaslighting him by pretending they didn't say the thing they said in the first place but then why did they tell him but then later it's like but he's going to f- come up against the thing anyway because the thing that they're lying about is like the source of the problem which is a problem that he and his new wife deliberately caused and is now coming after them to assassinate him to attack him and he is ostensibly the ruler and it it just goes back and forth forever and it makes it feel as a reader like none of this is anything and it feels like as a reader i am also supposed to be confused even if i can pick it apart and so, it's having just finished frustrating. It, having finished it, what they said in private was the real thing. Oh, yeah. No, I got that. Okay, yeah. I, I understood that, but the experience was frustration and not revelation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it feels like, as a reader, I am supposed to be confused whether or not I actually am. Yeah. And that was just, yeah, that <laughs> I'm not kidding about feeling like I wanted to just throw this book like far away from myself forever because I was done with it. Yeah, uh it took me a week to read this. Um I I don't think I broke it up with reading anything else during that time because I was just trying to get this done um time and that was this is this is this is the worst book I've read for the podcast. Like, and because I was reading it for the podcast, not just to review it and scope it out, um, with my written reviews, like with my written reviews, if I hate a book, I, I DNF because that might mean it's like not for me. And I recognize that not all books are for me and it's okay to stop with this because we're doing it for the episode. I thought, well, I have to finish it. Like there has to be at least one of us who finished it. And I, that didn't. That didn't make things better. Um, So with gaslighting, there's so much where the book is telling us that these things are like awesome and fine. And so so usually I I would think, okay, I understand antiheroes. I like antiheroes. Antiheroes are great. I would say that the vast majority of the books that I read, the hero qualifies as an antihero. Yeah, but when you have an anti-hero, usually, like, there's <laughs> one one way to generate um, conflict in a society is to have your hero be following either a different message or following it differently or more strictly or something than the society. So you can either have someone who's like, well, I know that this thing is bad, like, or it's illegal, but it's good, so I need to do it anyway. Or, you know, the, these things are so messed up that, like, lost my moral compass figuring out stuff, like, whatever. You can have an antihero. I love antiheroes. I love, like, I mean, there's characters where, like, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't condone everything that they do, but they're great characters. There's a setup in this book where you could have some really cool anti-hero mm-hmm. yeah. pro-living creature rights characters. Yeah. But instead, but. the anti-hero is all about just 
not communicating and brooding and oh I'm smarter than everybody else because I yep. don't want to tell you anything and don't believe other people when they tell me things. He doesn't demonstrate being better than anyone but everyone around him talks about how he's totally better than they are and I'm like well show me show me just all right if you're great and awesome can you like do some awesome things at all please um and then like later on there's a bit where uh they talk about this person who committed a genocide and killed a whole bunch of people and then like the next chapter and it's portrayed like as unequivocally a bad thing and then in like later that chapter or the next chapter Richard talks about how in a previous book he killed entire armies and did a whole bunch of stuff and like they don't use the word genocide but the thing that he's describing that he did is the same scale of mass death as the person that they a chapter earlier were talking about how they were totally awful for doing all that and so it was like boy it's awful that they killed all these people can but I, I'm so heroic can for I killing read the all quote, those people because I still have this open can I read your quote sure. from the review yeah yeah okay Robin has a line <laughs> in their review from when they first read the book that they said this out loud to me before I think before actually physically writing the review and then it it also made it into the review and both times when they said it to me and then also when I just read reread the review this morning uh it's wild not inaccurate and <laughs> terrifying Robin starts out a paragraph closer to the end of the review that says, the way genocide is portrayed is troubling. Yeah. <laughs> and the, th the problem is, <laughs> like, that's not, it's not wrong, and it's also not wrong for the obvious reasons, or not only the obvious reasons. Like, it's wild how much this book basically goes, everything the main character does is good and fine, and also it's good and fine if people are terrible to each other, but they're including the main character, but they're technically the good people. So it's okay. But quite literally, and we'll talk about this in a later topic, everything certain other people do is not good and fine because of who they are. Yep. And it's and the reason I'm, just frustrating. And the reason I'm mentioning like that disconnect between like two different handlings of maths, death and genocide mm -hmm. uh is because I felt gaslit as a reader because they would list like, yeah, here's all these things. That's how you totally know this person is awful. So in book, so in the previous book, Richard definitely did all of the things that we just listed are awful. But it's Richard, so it's fine. So it's and fine. Great and it's cool. okay. And yeah, nothing, nothing wrong with this. Um, and that just keeps going. Uh. And, oh, one, I think probably the last point for this section, mm -hmm. um, uh, Kalan, uh, his wife, is spoken of as awesome. Like, people are like, oh, yeah, Kalan's totally great. But then she doesn't actually do anything and sometimes has trouble figuring out very simple plot concepts. There's a bit where <laughs> she warns Richard about something. Yeah. He doesn't believe her. And then later he finally believes her because he sees in person that she was right. And he's like, oh my goodness, this thing is true. And she's like, oh, Richard is so amazing for having figured out that this thing is true and real. And it's like, come it's on. Like, it's like you could have just listened to you. You told you him. Right. This, is an, you told this him. isn't even a revelation to you. You made that observation. Yeah. And, and I, she's I, like, I oh my gosh, his intelligence. This is why the people adore him. How could I ever measure up? And it's like, hey. And that's, I believe that hey. was in her internal narration. Like, it's Yeah, no, she's not thoughts. saying this out loud. This is her talking to herself and she's like, oh, my husband. How wonderful. Because I know, I know there's like this kind of like toxic dynamic that's kind of a classic in American households. And I know it's probably like elsewhere as well, where like when you have this thing where like the wife doesn't really get to like speak her mind very much and has just had to like say things and then finally when the husband adopts the idea then it gets treated like it's a good thing um yeah usually this is that but internalized 
Right. And I don't know that it's not internalized all those cases, but like in this one yeah. specifically, she has the thought, she tells Richard, he's like, that's totally not it. And she says, okay. And then later <laughs> he's like, oh my goodness, this is totally it. And she's like, you are so awesome for figuring this out. Like, it just, it felt like that. It felt like, I uh, just, it's just, this is such a toxic, awful, such a toxic, awful marriage. And I'm like, how... I would say, how are you happy? But they're they're not. No. They're not. Like, it's not, it's not going well. Like, it's going well in the sense that, like, they're still together and all of the bad stuff doesn't seem to have harmed the momentum of their relationship. But I wouldn't consider having that be my day-to-day life in a relationship being a good relationship. Um, so anyway, on to our next... to our middle topic which is slavery oh robin you know what i just realized we didn't mention which is a pretty big deal because it's kind of antithetical to our normal way of doing these these episodes we started with our main character this time everybody (laughs) and now we're moving on to minor characters because yep the main the book tried to tell me richard was the bestest most awesomest main character and i said no (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the the main character is the perpetrator of so much things that we're not actually going to talk about his trauma anymore because we're going to center maybe some other people that like are actually going through things. Yeah, we'll talk about him a little bit in our last topic, but not much. Well, it's not. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I guess technically no, it's he, he is a little relevant to the last topic. Ugh. Anyway, um, <laughs> this topic is slavery. Okay, so about 200 pages in, from what I remember of how far into the book it is. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, this, it's chapter startling. 12. Yep. So uh, after 11 chapters of not this, all of a sudden we have a slave master dynamics copy pasted from a whitewashed understanding of the U.S. South pre-Civil War. With the caveat... That these are copy and pasted with the presumption that everyone who was enslaved thinks that this is a a thing that they are supposed to be and deserve and it's their fault. And I know, okay, I want to be very clear. I know other places and times have had slavery. The thing that tells me. Um, yeah, we can pinpoint his inspiration. Especially given that the author, the author uh, lives in, lived in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, the thing that tells me that the U.S. South pre-Civil War is the inspiration is that we open this section with the enslaved character being called boy and then thinking in his head how much he hates it when that slur is used for him. Yeah, there's some there's some very specific things. There's a lot of touchstones. There's a lot of touchstones yeah. where... Yes, we know these touchstones exist in other places in history, but, this but there's particular so combination. many. Yeah, there's so many things that really just look like somebody read some Civil War books and said, "What if the white supremacist narrative was true and exactly. believed, and then went with it?" And yeah, as like- Americans ourselves, white Americans, but still Americans, reading this is. <laughs> frustrating on a visceral level to yeah, hear because- the white narr- the 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 master supremacist narrative explained to us by the slaves which was it's bizarre it's, it's yeah. viscerally okay. upsetting and we're not even the ones who robin and myself specifically are not even the ones where this is our cultural um oppressive history of where like our ancestors were not the ones oppressed and it's it's viscerally upsetting to read yeah okay but it's partly upsetting because of like we know the thing that it's kind of it almost feels like it's this weird pastiche because like boy is a slur but it's the worst slur we ever see used in the book yeah and it's only used like a couple of times yeah like that's it there's and this so weird side didn't step have- <laughs> It's so that that part is so mild that if you didn't have him thinking, oh, I hate it when that slur is used for me, I wouldn't necessarily 
know for sure that it was used that it was a slur in the book because right. like there are there are places and times where you can call someone boy and it's not a slur and it's not a problem you should not call a black man boy like no fuck please no, no. <laughs> yeah. but um but there it's not but like the you word can never, itself ever, is a thing that we use for it's not like you can never children. ever say the word boy like, yeah it's, it's yeah it exists outside of that context everywhere in in english but this book used this, this book it goes, as the way to let us know this is what we're getting into. Yeah, They're slaves. This, this book goes out of its way to impress upon us that people are being degraded and tries really hard at the same time to both convince us that they like it and are happy about it from their own mm-hmm. words, not from their master's perspective, but from their perspective, they think this is fine. And also impress upon us that the author is doing nothing wrong because they're skirting around direct language. And it's just really annoying and frustrating to read. And like two of the enslaved Hawken talk about how much they deserve this because of how violent their ancestors are. And they talk about that more than once. And then later when one of them is violent at the direction of an Ander who are the people oppressing them, he worries that him doing violence at the direction of an Ander is actually his brutal hawk in nature showing, like, it's finally appearing. And it's just, I... And he and Beta have an entire conversation that I uh, summarized as, Hi, fellow oppressed minority. Do you ever think we'll not be evil? Or are we doomed because our oppressors are perfect? (laughs) Hello, fellow oppressed minority. We are wicked and evil and can never hope to do good. But maybe if we pray all day, taking on our oppressor's religion, everything will be okay enough for us to be punished less, but not zero. And I just want to point out, I did, I I said this, I, one of, one of these characters' names is literally beat a. B E A T A. Oh, and and Fitch. That's and because Fitch. everyone calls him Fetch. Yeah, because he's the one who goes and gets things. Yeah, like, the names are the, well, but I mean, that there's a different. But like, there's something my, slightly more. Yeah, for Beta. Yeah, yeah there there's several layers to that one that that Fitch doesn't have. Um, not the least because that is a a clearly, um degrading nickname and not that character's given name um there's a there's a level of <laughs> yeah there's some thing there's a bunch of things there but i mean one of those things a lot. if if he was if the author was trying to pull from this real world history but then just like uh not doing well one of the real things is that you know if if enslaved people like actually were given a name it it often related to their job so like that is like an actual thing um and so like fitch is a name actually is from for what i understand it is realistic and like beta's name like that that fits but it it just it's all these little things where like the words are getting close but then what we actually show just doesn't like they 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 talk like they're they're so happy to be enslaved it is nauseating and it's it's not a we're doing this in public to not be hurt more and then impri- right. it's like not performative. all of all of this is private conversations or internal monologue it's just it feels nonstop anytime these characters are the ones on screen and the, there's like as and again in the part of the book Nicole didn't get to like later on we have like power dynamics where men are over women the um ander nobles are over the hawken slaves but with permission from noblemen, enslaved men could be over noble women to help further noble men's goals. Yeah. And then the uh enslaved guy, I think he's technically a teenager. Yeah. gets blamed for everything and completely scapegoated. So he's literally just being used 
And, like, the narrative is aware that he's being used. It's like, so, and this is part of what I talked about a little bit in the first section, where, like, you can absolutely have characters who, like, do terrible things and don't like, but something about the way it it never lets up, and even in their private conversations, even though, like, bad stuff happens because they're enslaved and because they're powerless they seem like talking to each other are like happy about being enslaved the book never acknowledges problems and toxicity and like it just For sexual assault and rape culture, uh, this book tends to confuse the very distinct concepts of a polyamory consent sexual assault and rape and treats polyamory like it's uh, just rape or assault and then doesn't treat the actual assaults like a big deal. And it's just very... Um, troubling. Uh, just as a quick like list of just some examples from this book, and a non, uh, a non-exhaustive list. Eleven pages in, we're told that Richard is a child of rape. First, uh, we get backstory that he was assaulted and in a forced marriage from a previous book. Uh, the writing gets better in chapters where a woman is sexually assaulted or otherwise severely harmed, and. Uh, Beta is raped and a noblewoman Claudine is raped but then also there's like this weird non-consensual polyamory it's like everyone's supposed to be fine with it but individually people keep not being fine with it Uh, which results in Dalton's wife Teresa cheating on him she doesn't see it as cheating he does and they never ever talk about it uh, there's also the concept that the our main character's wife her magic oh, yeah. power canonically stops her from being sexually intimate with anyone because she will oh, yeah. harm them except magically for the main character it doesn't harm him and so of course she marries mm-hmm. him and he says he loves her very much yep Oh, yeah, so it means that he's the only one who could marry her and not die, which I I feel like it's, tr- I don't know, it, that feels simultaneously coercive for both of them, because for her, it's like, well, if I want to be with anybody, it has to be this guy. And then for him, like, their, their wedding night is the start of the book, like, the morning after their wedding night is the start of the book, so, you know, we haven't seen how they got to this point because we didn't read those but it it doesn't feel to me like he's being coerced at all it feels to me like he's taking advantage of her yeah especially because the way he treats her on screen we talk about this in previous sections but the way he treats her on screen is just not great yeah and we it in some of the previous books he was sexually assaulted so like part of what makes this all like mixed up is that at least some of the characters who like with there's consent issues just all around and some of those consent issues are played as totally fine not a consent issue what are you talking about and some of them are played as like being like bad but like the the thing with Beta, it's played as bad for how it makes Fitch upset that this girl that he likes was raped, but we don't spend very much time with the actual rape victim and how she feels about it. Yeah, like, no, we- it was completely it it felt very much on a possessive she's the object that I want but she's been soiled by somebody else hurting her. Mm -hmm. And so now I can't have her anymore, even though they're not a thing. They're not a thing. He's just obsessed with her as a concept and has decided that she's his. Yeah, they're not in a relationship. They don't end up in one later either. (laughs) Um, Well, that's that's positive. 
That's something, yeah. I guess. Well, she, as far as I remember, she doesn't end up with anybody. Well, um, that makes sense. Good for her. <laughs> yeah. She actually ends up running away to be a soldier on the wall. Like, I like, I like Vita. I like her arc. Oh, good. I like, yeah. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, At least you liked a character in this book. Yeah, yeah I liked one character. <sighs> and, okay, so I, I mentioned it briefly. I want to expound a little bit. The writing. I'm not even kidding. This It was enough that I could predict when one of these scenes was going to happen because the writing suddenly got better. The writing gets better in chapters where a woman is sexually assaulted or otherwise severely harmed. To the point that I started being... At first, it had this, like, weird incentive where, like, it felt like I was supposed to, like, those were the most interesting chapters, the best written chapters, and also the most disturbing, uh, depending on which qualitative version of disturbing you're going for, because there's a lot of them in this. And, but then later on, once I realized this connection, I started dreading the writing getting better, because that meant somebody else was about to be assaulted. And the only time I was wrong... A woman was in danger in a sword fight. So, but she doesn't actually end up getting hurt. Uh, and that, as a reader, that was really, really disturbing. And it just made the whole book feel like the book itself cares about rape because that's the only place where it cares about the writing. And not cares about rape in a care sense but like actively is advocating for it yeah like is most interested in depictions of rape i think so uh claudine is a noble woman who gets raped and when she tries to get help she then is um physically assaulted to shut her up <sighs> yep and it does it it shuts her up it stops her from talking. Um, a bunch of people, a bunch of, not quite random, like it made sense in the narrative, but like a bunch of people die towards the end of the book. So I don't totally remember whether she makes it out of the book alive or not. But she like, she shuts up and because she's trying to bring down this powerful guy and his underling doesn't want him brought down. So he shuts her up. But then... The underling's wife is having sex with the boss. And so he turns on his boss because his wife is having consensual sex with this other guy. There's there's so many layers of bad and awful. I'm just I'm just sad now because like ideally, if you're listening to this, you haven't read this awful book and we don't <laughs> recommend that you do. And so I think the main thing to take away from this section is I think the way that it conflates um, polyamory and consent issues and consensual non-monogamy uh, because like with the bit where the wife sleeps with someone else, he's the wife and the husband say to each other's faces, no, this is just how it works. And it's totally fine. Like the guy after he finds out that it's been happening, he tells her, no, it's totally fine for you to keep doing this. But dear reader, it was not fine. He's actually not okay with it. And it fuels his revenge. Um, like it, it just, and then with the polyamory with Richard, he literally didn't agree to at least two of his three marriages. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um what you've said about his second wife or first wife, one of the two. Oh, uh, yeah. So partway through, because there's this prophecy that like will be fulfilled by somebody who is like thrice married or something, and Richard marries the person who he thinks of as the second person he has married at the very start of the book, but then later. Uh, someone shows up and says, hey, I'm your wife and I'm pregnant. And he's like, we have not slept together. I barely remember you. Like, yeah, we did meet in a previous book, but I don't remember you. And so, oh, uh, it's got, uh, we could have, we could have talked about uh, colonialism and weird, uh, just 
patronizing thoughts about uh, other cultures and thinking of other cultures as primitive. That could have been one of our topics. It well, wasn't, but we, we, could have we could have talked that. about it in topic two, but we had so yeah. much that we just yeah, yeah, didn't. It there. I, it I says that up. a lot. I bring that up. Yeah, it says a lot that we ran out of time to talk about all of the ways cultures are being treated badly by other cultures. Yeah, in this book, and I bring that up here just to say that the reason that he turns out to actually be married to this third woman and for this child to be thought of as his child even though they have not had sex is kind of hand waved as a yeah there was this ceremony but it's this other culture ceremony and I didn't really understand what was going on and like yeah she said we were married but I didn't think it was like a real wedding sorry I forgot to tell you about it like that's the explanation the explanation is I didn't bother to learn about another culture, a culture I was living with at the time. I didn't bother to learn about them. I didn't know what their ceremony was. But now that it turns out we are married, I'm going to take this very seriously. I need you to accept that this is now my third wife. Yeah. And it's weird because the conversation there that would make sense to me would be, hey, this person... And the people that I was living with and trusted to live with married me against my will. But instead, the book wants to turn it into something that is now harmful for his consensually married bride. Like, that's that's really terrible. <laughs> and it, it's like, it's not, it's not a healthy depiction of polyamory. No. Like, it's just not, like... Polyamory is fine. This isn't it. <laughs> like, ugh. yeah, that's my feelings. Ugh. <laughs> About this. And on that note. Yep. Hi, I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, and I'm the host of CPOV Autographs at CertainPOV.com. It is a bi-weekly interview series where I interview folks from all over the arts, from writers to comedians to magicians to musicians, even actors, historians, podcasters, pretty much anyone who's willing to chat with me for a little bit. If you like interesting conversations with even more interesting people, go to CertainPOV.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, music is life and life is good. On to our wrap-up and ratings for the gaslighting. I I think it's either moderate or severe. The amount the book is attempting to do, I think, is moderate. The amount that actually happens as a reader feels severe. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting severe because we don't care about what the author was trying. <laughs> it's how did they do it. Yeah. And the thing that happened here was severe yeah especially in terms of reader experience yeah yeah um slavery torture Um, porn okay i have a counter to which one for slavery being torture porn i think that the sexual assault was torture porn but the slavery was mild which is a disturbing combination uh I think that our category for torture porn is that you are supposed to agree with what is happening. Oh, and enjoy it. Okay. All right. Nope. I'm on board with that then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's voyeuristic. It is. But. Yeah. Both. Both of those categories are for very different reasons. But. Torture porn. Yeah. You read these scenes and you are supposed to look at this and go, good, fine. Like you're supposed to like it the thing and agree with the thing and it's not okay my one pushback on torture porn is i think you're supposed to have the reaction of oh that's not that bad you and do. that's why i want to say mild no no that's yeah but that's part of torture porn is that you look at it and go yes just right well for me part of the torture porn is that it's extremely severe like the severe I, it has to be I at think least that's severe a, to I cause torture porn i don't to think me. i don't i disagree <laughs> The sexual assault definitely is torture definitely porn. is torture porn, yeah. In the classic sense of that term, <laughs> in yep. the literal, yeah. Yep. Anyway, uh, trauma, integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant. Gaslighting, integral. 
because without it, everyone would communicate well and we wouldn't have a plot and they wouldn't have to spend a lot of time. Eh, we have a we- third of the book. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> We'd have a third of this 750-ish page book. <laughs> yeah, without, yeah, Without yeah, the yeah. gaslighting. Anyway, uh, the slavery... Um, I, I don't think actually it's interchangeable. Know. Okay, I was going to ask because I didn't get far enough in it to know if it ever interacts with the plot. <laughs> okay, so so here's the thing. Because, okay, so my contention is they didn't actually depict slavery. What they actually, because it just, and you listen to our section the middle, the section on this topic for more details, obviously, because this is the wrap-up. Yeah. But what they, they didn't actually depict uh, slavery. They depicted a, a caste structure. No. Thick. Uh, no. Uh, the, the, the things that they put in it could have been explained away by classism without having to make it be enslavement. I, I would argue they did depict slavery, explicitly no no you no, could no that's have interchanged were, it for labor. something else so i agree with your interchangeable i disagree with your statement that they didn't no, depict this let me thing. Uh, elucidate okay i'm uh, the reason i'm saying it's interchangeable is because yes the label on it is slavery they are technically enslaved but all of the things that happened under that are interchangeable under the label of classism plus rape culture like, you, it didn't actually have to be that anybody owned anybody, and the plot would be untouched. Okay, no, I'm That's saying- That's what I, I'm trying to convey. Okay. So you're you're not saying they didn't do the thing, you're saying that no, the no, thing no. could have been traded in. Okay. Yeah, like they literally, interchangeable. They I literally agree with that. They literally had slavery. Like, they are enslaved, but all the details of it could have yeah. hit no, I, I got this you. other heading seamlessly. Yeah. Um, And then the sexual assault is- I mean, um, I think it's I think interchangeable. It's... Ugh. Is it interchangeable? There's so much of it that if there were none in the book, the, the book wouldn't happen. But almost all mm. of the things could have still happened without somebody being assaulted. Like. Hmm. Okay. I think, like, some of them would have been covered by blackmail. Some of them could have been covered with some other form of violence. But I. I. I, they didn't do things for the actual plot, generally speaking. I was going to argue that in the part that I read, it seemed pretty irrelevant. But if you think it actually has any bearing later ever, then sure, interchangeable. Uh, care. Gaslighting. No. 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 Just no. Uh, torture, or torture porn. Slavery. No. No. Rape. No. No. Uh, point of view. This is a lot of point of views. I think we can just put multiple because there's so many and it's not the a- The one that I will note is that uh, I believe every, except most of the time someone is sexually assaulted, we- <sighs> We don't get, we kind of get usually, like an observer. Usually. I think there's one where we get- the actual person, maybe. And there's so much sexual assault in this book that it's kind of disturbing how many times you're just watching it happen to somebody else. Um, given that there are so many, like, outright assault and dubious consent situations. Um, the, the dubious consent situations usually happened with Richard and they're played positively. Okay. But the ones that are definitely assault are... Usually not from the perspective of the person hurt. Um, for the aspiring writer tip. So, did <sighs> you know that you can write an epic <laughs> fantasy book without sexual assault? Like, you can? Um, and if you're gonna write one with sexual assault, uh, please, uh, understand how consent works and when things are and are not consensual. Like, please. Just please. Yeah. That's that's my writer tip. Oh, oh, no, actually, here's my other writer tip. Um, don't have your main character uh, 
praise random cultures for doing basic things just because they're not your main character's culture. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. Uh, favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? Um, You had one. I do. Do you have one? Um, I like the ending of Beta's storyline. Okay. Do you want my joke one or my real one? Or, or what order do you want these in? Uh, both. Uh, the real one first. Uh, the joke one first. Joke one first. My favorite non-traumatic thing about this is that I had prior knowledge about how bad it was going to be and you said you didn't care if I didn't finish it, so I didn't. <laughs> um, My <laughs> real one is I love that a chicken descendant of dinosaurs uh. is portrayed as being violent and that's weird. <laughs> And eating bugs is like this scary thing a chicken is doing. <laughs> because from the things that I have been told about chickens by people who raise chickens, mm -hmm. chickens are still predators. They're mm -hmm. just predators that we have taken and slaughter for food. They're the predator version of our cows. Like they are an animal we've decided is food and raises food. But they're absolutely still predators. They just don't hunt people they hunt like bugs and rodents and like <laughs> yeah you know just but the fact that this author went chickens are harmless what could be the scariest thing a chicken that claws you and it's like what <laughs> what what are you talking yeah. about like granted like if you've never like, if you don't know that chickens can be dangerous, it means that you <laughs> won't take this seriously as a threat. And probably yeah. if you have kept chickens, you'd be like, no, those, those, no. Uh, their feet are sharp. Every, no, that's dangerous. Every, every story or everything I've ever heard about chickens by people who raise chickens is that their chickens will hunt things for fun, run around with the corpses shrieking their heads off like celebrating the hunt like chickens are not <laughs> peaceful animals and that just description of like the violent chicken is so weird and so like okay sure great <laughs> it, it just yeah i don't know that that's technically non-traumatic well the chicken was portrayed as non-traumatic when or non-violent when chickens are not that thing but yeah that was my favorite quote-unquote non-traumatic thing about this book all right uh okay my uh brain is mush after talking about this terrible book uh thank you for making it to the end of the episode if you yay. did yay yay proud of you we we uh, probably wasn't hard to tell. We don't recommend this one. No, nope. we don't. We reviewed it because this series is very popular and has over thirteen books in it. Um, Woo. I think it has like twenty something. Like it has a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, we will catch you in a fortnight. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>